It's not hard to have a contract worth more than half a million dollars. I, I think it's worth spending a little bit of money talking to a solicitor who's got some experience in the area about, you know, what can I do to make this a bit better? What might I think about? What special conditions should I insert? Those sorts of questions. You are listening to the Property Developer Podcast, your home for tips, ideas, and inspiration to help take your developing to the next level. Now, here's your host, Justin Getty. Hello and welcome to episode 63 of the show. Thanks for joining me. How are you doing? Keeping on top of things I trust? I've been really well. Plenty going on at the moment. Feels like a lot has happened since the last episode. Market sentiment and momentum has noticeably picked up across Melbourne and it seems in other cities too. Property values have been steadily rising and confidence is returning to the property sector, which is great news for property developers. A lot of the doom and glooms, news stories have dried up and we seem to be at the start of a new growth cycle. An incredible amount has happened since we last spoke. We finally received a planning permit for our project that had been drifting through planning for nearly two years. It was great to finally get that stamp letter and we can move on to the documentation and sales phase. And the timing might work well as the market shifts gears. On my other project, we have settled on a funding solution and have received a term sheet from a financier, so we're working through all the requirements of that. The valuation report is almost complete, and then we will get the quantity surveyors report knocked over once we finalise some details with the builder. But we're pretty close to settling on our contract price and all the various inclusions. So it's all happening on that project too. Feels like more has happened in the past six weeks than most of the past 12 months. So it's nice to have a sense of momentum with the projects. And speaking of momentum, if you want to get some momentum going with your plans to start property developing, then remember we have the mentoring program that is available to teach you everything you need to know to become a successful developer. Email me on justin at propertydeveloperpodcast.com for further details. Okay, on to today's guest, our first legal discussion with property lawyer Lewis O'Brien. Lewis specialises in property and commercial law, with a particular interest in serving property developers and investors. With more than 20 years of experience, Lewis has seen plenty of contracts across his desk, and also the sticky situation some people find themselves in when property deals go wrong. We have a fairly broad conversation covering such topics as covenants, options, joint ventures, contracts, and the common pitfalls that you should look out for. During the discussion, Lewis refers to some useful resources that he has available on his website and I'll provide the access code for those following our chat. I think you will enjoy this conversation and I started off as usual by asking Lewis what food he would eat until he was sick. There's these nice uh, Vietnamese rolls. Do they bum me? Oh yeah, with the... Crackling pork. In oh, yeah. Got to be crackling pork. Good crackling pork, some spiced vegetables, nice fresh bread. That's me. Yeah, I reckon they're hard to get right, though. I have Not everyone other... gets it right, I agree with you, but... I had one the other day and it was left me feeling really, really underwhelmed and disappointed. <laughs> You're looking for the place with the queue out the door. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> there was no queue. Ah, uh, well. <laughs> now, tell us, we're here to talk about legal issues related to property developing. Yes. Give us a bit of a background on yourself and how you got into law and specialising in property. Um, I mean, it's a very long time ago. I've been practising law for something like um, 25 years and as one of my clients pointed out, you get less than that for murdering someone. Um, and for most of that, you know, I, spent a, I spent probably five or six years in town at a couple of the bigger firms, um, I guess doing my apprenticeship, if you like. And then after that, I went, on my, went out on my own and I've been acting for property investors pretty much ever since. Um, you know, and I, I enjoy working with property investors. They're generally people who are fairly positive. They have goals and things they want to achieve. Um, and I think that's, that, that suits my style because I think a lot of people don't like lawyers because the only set time they see a lawyer is when something's gone wrong. They're therefore paying lots of lawyers' fees to fix up a mistake they wish didn't happen and a lot of them are just avoidable. So lawyers end up with this bad reputation, and of course lawyers are also very good at profiting from those problems. 
So I've always tried to do things a little differently. I try to, if, if I can be a bit more proactive, if we can provide advice in advance, if we can talk to people about contracts before they sign them. Yes, that does involve a, a small investment up front, but it's a lot cheaper um, in, in many dimensions than waiting until something blows up in your face. And property uh, is an area that's quite diverse, I would have thought, from a, a legal point of view. Yeah, it is diverse, and I mean, as I said, we, we focus on acting pro for property investors, and that's everyone from a home buyer who's basically, whether they realise it is, or not, a property investor, because that'll probably be their biggest investment asset, um, all the way through to sort of people who want to develop, you know, 20 unit sites or create a portfolio of 100 properties or whatever else they want to do. And, you know, our goal is to try and provide the services they need and the advice and the expertise to help um, make those goals more achievable. And so, do the majority of property transactions go smoothly? And it's sort of the rough ones that that become well known, or is it? Look, I think that's true. Um, you know, most transactions do go relatively smoothly. Most people behave reasonably. Um, so yeah, it's the minority of cases that you read about in the paper, and I don't think they're representative at all. Yeah. And so, I mean, we, when people come to you looking for advice, what is it generally that they're worried about or that they want help with or that you focus on in terms of the advice or the areas that you start looking at initially? It very much depends on the transaction and the client. Um, what, what intrigues me is the more successful clients, almost without fail, are the ones who are more proactive in terms of obtaining advice. Um, you know, one particular client I won't name has probably bought a couple of hundred properties. He will not buy a property in Victoria until we've seen the contract and given him some feedback. On the other hand, you know, you get mum and dad homeowners who, and one of my favourite con contrasts is before they buy a $30,000 car, they'll spend months studying, they'll do all sorts of, they'll take it for a test drive, they'll have their friends around, RACV inspections, the whole bit. The same person will walk into a house for, you know, 750000 on the basis of a 15-minute walkthrough, and they really don't know what they're looking for, sign a 50-page contract they don't understand and, and put themselves on the hook for 750000 It's like, it doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Actually, why are contracts so long? So I was flicking through a contract of sale for a piece of land that I'd purchased, and you read, <laughs> there's so many clauses in there. and Because the government's improved them. You see, the government has this point of view that... Um, the reason why consumers particularly make bad mistakes is they don't have enough information. So, you know, in the duration of my career, once upon a time, a, a fairly typical um, land contract, uh, the, the short end, they were six to ten pages, going back 20 years. Now anything under 50 pages is short, and that's because the government got involved with all this consumer disclosure and extra information, all this sort of stuff is supposed to help. But the reality is people are overwhelmed by these contracts. And, and I mean, some of them I'm seeing at the moment are over 300 pages. I mean, people have no ability to read that process and understand what they need to draw out of it. So they don't. Well, so I mean, all this extra information, it just makes it less likely they're going to read anything. So a, a 300 page contract? What the, what the hell is... <laughs> <laughs> well, what's not in there? Well, yeah, the kitchen sink <laughs> maybe, but you no, know, a 300 page contract, you know, if you're buying a, a block of land off the plan, you know, and off the plan contracts tend to be at the longer end, you've probably got, you know, in some cases 30 or 40 pages of plan of subdivision, a couple of restrictive covenants, then they want a des design guidelines and who knows what else is in there, but you know, it's not hard to get these contracts over 300 pages. And so your standard contract that you would get in any state, of, you know, REIV or real estate, New South Wales or Victoria, every state has this sort of standard real estate sales contract. Well, to What's a point. What's your view on those? I mean, look, I, I don't have a problem with the standard contracts. I mean, what I do have a problem with is what we're doing in Victoria at the moment, which is basically just over 10 years ago, they brought in basically compul uh, pretty much a compulsory format for a contract with standard general conditions. From a professional's point of view, that was great because that was six pages where I knew they hadn't changed it, so I didn't need to read those clauses because I was aware of them. Anyway, that regime has passed away now, and the wonderful Law Institute of Victoria has introduced their new preferred special conditions, but they're more interested in making a buck out of them by licensing the use of them than they are making them compulsory. So we're now back to a position where we've got all sorts of general conditions all over the place. No one really knows what they are, so we're back to reading another six or 
eight pages of you know legalese. Um, I don't see how that's in anyone in anyone's interests except the law institute who are making license fees out of it. And so, would you recommend people have their own sales contracts drawn up where they can? Or look, on the whole, I'm a fan of standard form contracts um, for a number of reasons. I mean, first of all, they're quicker because you don't have to pay someone to draft it all up. Second of all, they're cheaper because of that. And the third thing is, I mean, and, and whether we're talking about a contract of sale or a lease, um, you know, if they're standard form contracts, they're generally more acceptable and more easier, more, more simple to get the other side to sign them up. Yeah, that's what I would have thought. You're sliding a, a special, specially drawn up contract to someone. I wonder whether they start thinking, what are they trying to sneak in here? If they're not using a standard contract. Well, you know, I mean, the, the big firms in town don't like using standard form contracts because theirs is, you know, their precedent is, is better in some degree. But I've got to say, when someone gives me a 30-page non-standard lease, my reaction is, oh dear, I've got to read that now. <laughs> so we both have the same reaction then. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I tried reading through a contract the, uh, the other day and it, it's hard work, really hard work. Look, it can be, you know, some, and some contracts are drafted better than others, um, you know, but sometimes it is hard work and sometimes it's just dense legalese and it's really, really hard work just to sort of chew through it. Yeah, well, let's zero in on property development related sure. contracts for the moment. There's a couple of other areas that I want to touch on that you've mentioned. Let's go with a, a land sale. Mm -hmm. If I'm, as a developer, looking at a piece of land that's for sale, mm -hmm. what should I be looking for in the contract, sort of red, red flags or what are the key parts of it? Um, so if someone's given you a contract of sale for a piece of land you want to develop, I mean, there's a few sort of key issues at the moment. GST is always an important one, just making sure you've got head around what that should be. Um, if I was going to buy it to develop it, I'd want, um, you know, I'd probably want some special conditions in there that give me access to the site before settlement that give me the ability to start the sort of planning approval process because there's, yeah, planning approval unfortunately takes a ridiculously long time these days. So if I can start that process before settlement, that's you know holding costs I don't wear. Um, I'm a big fan of the idea that property development you know, is more profitable if I can turn projects over faster. Um, and that will certainly help. Um, depending on where you're at, due diligence clauses are, can be important um, and making sure you've got the right one and one that works. And then there's obviously a raft of things you'd look at from a due diligence perspective. Um, one of the more common issues we're seeing at the moment is around drainage. Uh, I don't think it's a secret that large parts of Melbourne are marginal in terms of whether they've got enough drainage capacity. And as we um, continue with infill development, we put more stress on our drainage systems. And it's a bit the luck of the draw, but if you get the wrong one, you may well end up with a fairly expensive um, expansion of the drainage system that you're paying for is you know, basically the unlucky next cab off the rank. <laughs> uh, um, due diligence clause you mentioned, mm -hmm. What's, how would you draft a due diligence clause? Um, well the first thing, I mean look I've seen some wonderful due, dil due diligence clauses that are two pages long. Um, that's probably going over the top. I think it's about being succinct but also clear about what you're doing. So make sure it's clear um, what the time frame is. Um, you probably want access to information or the vendor's cooperation or access to the property in the, while this is going on. Um, and then you want to make sure that you've got a clear date by which it expires and a clear mechanism to terminate and then probably a provision that you get whatever holding deposit you've paid back. And I imagine that can be fairly clearly drafted. Oh yeah, I mean if you can't do that in, well, it, I should say, I, yeah, I'm not one of those solicitors that thinks I'm getting paid by the word. So, I mean, if you can't get it done in sort of a third of a page, I don't think you're trying that hard. And then what else through the contract would you be scanning for? Oh, gee. Caveats? You know, caveats don't worry me so much. I mean, depending on exactly what they are. I mean, if, if the vendor has borrowed money and there's a caveat securing it on title, it's the vendor's job to get rid of it. it, it it's, it's perhaps a signal that my vendor has some debt, so maybe they're under a bit, maybe under a bit of financial pressure, maybe. Um, but on the whole, that's their problem to get rid of. So that's that's not one that would worry too much, me too much. A matrimonial style caveat uh, that'd make me think a little harder. Um, so it's not caveats that worry me so much. I mean, things like covenants 
easements, you know, they can actually sort of very um, significantly affect the utility of a development site. You know, for example, single dwelling covenants are causing a bit of an issue in, in a lot of suburbs in Melbourne at the moment. And, you know, if you've got one of those and don't realise it, um, that can be a problem. I mean, there's a story I remember about a, a bloke in North Melbourne who built two townhouses on a site and found out that he had a single dwelling covenant after he'd finished. So he was off to the Supreme Court to beg forgiveness, basically. Yeah. Um, I'm glad you touched on single dwelling covenants. Um, I've got some interest in them, and I know people I speak to also, the listeners of the show. Can you just talk us through what they are, how you go about getting them lifted? I think it's slightly different in each state, but... Oh, of course it's different in each state because it uh, keeps more regulators employed, yeah. and that's apparently a good thing. Look, a covenant in very simple terms is, is, a, um, is a restriction on your title, something you can generally can't do with it. Now, some of them are benign, like there's a lot of Eastern Melbourne, for example, has a quarrying covenant. You can't use your property as a quarry. Well, that's not going to trouble too many people in this day and age. On the other hand, there are a range of sort of single dwelling covenants, which basically say that you can only have one dwelling on the property. Um, or sometimes they regulate um, what you can construct them out of, so they must be brick or stone in some, in some cases. Or if you go into um, some of the new um, subdivisions and developments, often the covenants require you to comply with a whole design guideline, which is like 30 or 40 pages of building requirements, you know, in terms of what you can build, where you can build it, what style, who has to approve it, all that sort of gear. So there's a range of um, obligations that can be imposed by these covenants. As you say, we're seeing a lot of interest in single dwelling covenants. I guess a lot of the easy infill development sites are being taken and done. And the next sort of round of sort of attractive sites all have these covenants on which have sort of made it too hard in the first round. So we often see the question from developers, well, how do I remove this covenant? Um, I, and I guess my first answer to that question is removing it may not be the right question. Would it, it is generally easier to vary them. So instead of having a single dwelling covenant, can I put a two dwelling covenant on it so it'll allow me to subdivide but leave the covenant in place? Generally, my experience is council's more comfortable with that sort of approach um, and getting council who does have the power to vary or remove covenants um, to, to exercise their power to do so is generally cheaper and faster because that's one option. The other option is an application of the Supreme Court of Victoria. Um, and then that is not, you know, I think in anyone's imagination, the cheapest way to do anything. I didn't. I thought councils weren't responsible for covenants, that they were civil uh, matter between. Uh, the councils, were... generally speaking, don't create these covenants. Yeah. Um, but they do have power to vary and remove them. Um, you know, said, um, and, and my experience is that getting them varied is easier than getting them removed. And so, in the example of an East Melbourne old block of land that has a single dwelling covenant and one that says no quarrying mm. and actually our home has the same, <laughs> that same we've got a covenant that says no quarrying yeah, and just make sure the kids don't be, dig a big hole in the backyard well, no, hopefully we don't have gold or anything <laughs> in the backyard that they start digging up i don't think you own that anyway yeah but um what's what's the deal there in terms of an obviously old covenant that may not be um, fit for purpose in this day and age in terms of having to provide Look, new housing. Yeah, I mean, if you have a no quarrying covenant on, on your title, and most of them, I, I should say, do include an, a, an exclusion for basically digging foundations, so they allow you to remove enough soil to dig your foundations. Most of those, I, I think, don't trouble anyone. So I guess technically you could go to either the council or the court and say that these um, this covenant is... Um, you know, superfluous, the nature and character of the region has changed, we don't need it, um, you know, it should be removed. And I don't think anyone would disagree with you, um, but why would you spend the time and money to do that? Because it's not really stopping you doing anything that you sensibly want to do. Mm. But if you want to develop it? It's a, a no quarrying covenant's not going to stop you subdividing, it's not going to stop you putting in, um, well, generally speaking, it won't stop you putting in an underground basement if that's what you want to do. Um, you know, so it's not going to stop you doing anything that most sensible people want to do. Yeah. And so 
My understanding is that you, to get a covenant varied, you have to figure out who the beneficiary, beneficiaries are of the covenant? Yeah, in terms of process, um, you know, um, the covenant will, um, it will burden um, the piece of land you're looking at buying, let's say. There will be beneficiaries of that covenant, which will typically be all the other landowners in that subdivided piece of land. So, depending on the size of the block that was subdivided to create your the, the block you're looking at buying, that could be anywhere from you know two or three on the small end, up to fifty or a hundred or more potential beneficiaries. Um, depending on how you go about um, dealing with the covenant, you may need consent from all of them. For example, if you're going to the Supreme Court, ideally you want all of those people to consent to what you want to do. Uh, which in this day and age when you want to subdivide or do something like that, getting 50 neighbours to agree to that is not likely. Um, but as I said, the council also have the power to vary these things and council will form their own view as to whether, you know, how much merit that uh, covenant or that restriction has in the current day and age, um, whether anyone's going to be adversely affected and whether they're in favour of it. So I'll come back to the Supreme Court process, but with the council, so how does it work in terms of a council varying a covenant, or how would you apply, how does that work? Oh, the, the council will have an application process. You apply to have your, your, your um, covenant either varied or removed. They will then go through an advertising process, seek objections. They will then form a view based on the level of objection you get. Now, one of the things that, that's you know, increasingly an issue, and particularly there are some areas of Melbourne where it is known that there are um, members of that sort of that that subdivision that are violently object uh, violently object to subdivision, and they will aggressively pursue objections to council, appeals to the Supreme Court, whatever they have to do to stop anyone subdividing. So sometimes a little bit of local knowledge in terms of whether you buy next door to one of these people can be uh, worth something. And so then what, it's similar to a planning process then, is it? Very much so, yeah. Yeah. So the council was said, they'll advertise it, they'll notify immediate neighbours generally, um, they'll see what the level of objection is, what the basis of objection is, and then form a view. Now councils, are, are, I've got to say, are fairly conservative about this, um, and they're very, you know, they will vary them um, particularly, but if there is a huge community backlash, they're going to be reluctant to do that. Mm -hmm. And how long does that take, and how much does it cost? I mean, it's not so much the cost of the the application to council the problem, and it can take, you know, can easily take three months or more. Um, it's it's really the expert, um, you know, it's paying someone to prepare the application, the expert reports that may need to go with it. You know, issues that often come up are around traffic, so maybe you need some sort of traffic study um, and potentially other sort of studies done as part of the council's process, and that's where you're going to start to spend some serious money. And then the actually, I just wanted to ask why. I mean, some of these older ones. Why were they put in place? I guess when you uh, had old greenfield sites hundred years ago. Look, I think even a hundred years ago, I think there was an association between larger block sizes and an upmarket area. And so I think often the view was that we're going to try and create a premium development. We're going to stop people subdividing into smaller lots. Um, and that's attractive. Okay, and then the Supreme Court option mm -hmm. sounds expensive and long. Well, look, I mean, in terms of long, I mean, three months might do you, but yeah, I mean, basically, again, you're going to be invited to contact each of the other beneficiaries of that covenant um, to get some feedback, um, affidavit material, you know, lawyers, barristers, and then argument in the Supreme Court. Um, and, and the court will make its own view. Again, they're going to be on the conservative side, so don't, don't just assume they're going to rubber stamp your application. Um, and that will depend on the, the amount of and the strength of the objections they receive. And so can you look around an area and go, there's been a lot of covenants lifted here, or there's been a lot knocked back? Look, yeah, I, I think help. that's a useful, you know, if I'm looking at a development site, um, and I can see that the covenant's been lifted on two or three properties immediately around it that are definitely part of the same subdivision, then I'm thinking, well, that gives me a more realistic chance of being able to follow the same path. Someone, you know, What I don't want to do is be the first person 
on this sort of group of subdivided lots to actually run this application. Because at this point in time, that would make me suspicious that there's someone out there who is aggressively preventing these, um, these variations or these removals going through. Whereas on the other hand, if I can see that two or three of the adjoining properties, you know, people started to do it, that suggests that um, uh, yeah, me doing it too is, is very much more viable. And so the beneficiaries, are they parcels of land or are they individuals? And does the, 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 whatever, does the, the cover stay with the land or the person? The single dwelling covenants are generally um, the, the, the beneficiaries or all the other lots in that subdivision. Possible to do it different ways, but that's the most common version. Um, and that means that you, I mean, everyone else has the benefit of the covenant on your property, but you also have the benefit of the same covenant on everyone else's. So is it with the land? Runs with the land, yes, Runs generally. with the land, okay. And where is that all recorded? Look, on when you do a title search, there should be a reference to covenants. Sometimes it's in the plan of subdivision, but there will generally be a covenant recorded on title and you can get a copy of that. Um, again, it should be a public document. Um, from the titles office or you know your lawyer or conveyancer should be able to get it for you and and then if you're looking at buying a block of land i mean it should be in your section 32 or vendor statement yeah well, it's usually just one little line isn't it that mentions it oh look maybe but i mean i, I would thought the best practice in this day and age and one of the reasons why we're out to sort of large um contracts is that yeah, rather than just one line, you should actually have a copy of it in your, in your vendor statement to do it properly. Mm. All right, and then just a little bit earlier, we were talking about the need for being clear or being aware with the various contracts that you enter into as a property developer, because as, as you mentioned, yeah, you're probably going to enter into a dozen or more contracts along the way. Yeah, look, I mean, a property development generally does involve something like a dozen contracts. I mean, everything from your purchase contracts, contract when you first acquire the site, you know, let, let's get your due diligence clauses right, let's get your access clauses right, let's get your, um, you know, you, you, the ability to start your plans and permits early if we can, all the way through to, um, you know, settling the settling your office plan and sales um, at the back end. Um, and in between, there's all sorts of consultants you know, council agreements, finance agreements, building contracts, all sorts of things you need. Um, and I guess one of my frustrations is that I'm seeing the same sorts of mistakes being made fairly repetitively, um, causing the same sorts of problems. And, and again, I mean, I, I think the old model of sort of using lawyers is I'll do, I'll, I'll do it as best as I can and as soon as I hit a problem I'll go see my lawyer then I'll have this expensive bill and I'm unhappy. I think the better model is to say, well, let's get some advice up front, let's try and avoid the common mistakes, let's try and do it better and faster. Um, and you know, that's, that's where I think you know, modern lawyers have a role. Yeah, and what are the common mistakes? If we're talking about, um, well, let me give you a story. I had a client ring me, he, he had a um, town planner type person who was, or a draftsman who was preparing some designs that he wanted to submit to council. And this guy was, uh, I think had some personal issues and basically the work wasn't being done. And I said to him, you know, even before I see the contract that you signed, I can guarantee you there's a number of things wrong with it. The first is there's no time frame on this consultant's um, obligations, and he'll be blaming the uncertainties of town planning, but he's got no time frame in which to deliver anything. Um, you will not have any rights to the intellectual property that's being created. You will not have rights to get electronic copies of it or editable copies of it, all of which you really need if you want to take this project to another you know, draftsman um, or, or architect and get this finished. And I said, so, you know, um, that's going to make it hard in terms of me achieving what you as the client want, which is to basically get rid of your non-performing um, draftsman. It's going to make it really hard because the contract doesn't support that. So basically you're going to have to go and do the equivalent of beg and, and ask him to be reasonable because you don't have the right to insist on it. And, you know, it's one example. Um, you know, a consultant contract um, where, you know, it was just signed without a great deal of thought. It was very long on how much you had to pay, when you had to pay, what it was for and what the consultant could do if you didn't pay, and very short on what the consultant was doing and when it had to be done. And, you know, sometimes I think a little bit of a perspective from someone who's sort of seen things go wrong and ha has an idea of what best practice looks like can add a lot of value. And, and, and often it's 
almost as if you're not aware of that value because if it's done properly, you don't have these problems. You never have to think about it again. It just seems easier. Yeah, so, so I was listening to someone the other day who was describing contracts as disagreements. It's because the only time you want to have to pull them out and start looking through them is when there's a disagreement. It should really be called agreements. There's some truth in that, but at the same time, and you know, I think this is true of joint ventures, I mean, a good agreement is part of a process. Um, if you have a good discussion, um, if you explore some of the uncomfortable stuff about what happens when things go wrong, you know, how, what are, how are we protected, how do we deal with problems, that will lead to a better agreement. And then, you know, again, in the case of a joint venture, if we capture the agreement, uh, if we capture a good agreement well, we can put that in the bottom drawer and no one's going to look at it again and that's a great result. Yeah. Because hopefully that means the joint venture's gone well, everyone understands what their rights and obligations are and it's clear. I'm going to come back to joint ventures. I just want to ask you back on contracts and building contracts. You, make it, you mentioned that earlier or off air that there were some things you like to look at or when things go wrong, there's issues that are easily identified that shouldn't have been in the contracts in the first place. Around well, payments not, and deposits. It's not so much and... things that shouldn't have been there, but again, you know, I'm sort of keen on these sort of top five lists. I mean, you know, I can look at building contracts, and most people, you know, I think there's five key things that people do wrong with them, and that, that you know, when something does, so five key things that people don't get right with the contract, and when they run into problems, they've really got nowhere to go. Um, so, for example, um, liquidated damages is always an interesting question. Um, the builder will tell you that $250 a week is the standard um, the figure, um, or one one builder recommend, said that the Master Builders Association recommended $750 a week. Um, but, but that's not the point, because what happens is liquidated damages is, is what you as the developer get paid if your build is a week late. Um, and, and what I think developers need to think about is how much is it going to cost me if this project runs a week late? And in very simple terms, you know, if you've got um, you know, a couple of million dollars worth of land, most of a three million dollar build, and you assume you've got your finance at 6%, it's probably going to cost you something like $5,000 a week every week the build is late. And this is not about um, trying to you know, make money at the builder's expense. Um, and in a perfect world, you don't ever get it because it means the build is finished on time. What it does mean is that the builder, if they are don't organise themselves well or they've been overly aggressive with their time estimates, they will pay for that mistake. And, and you know, I think that's a good thing. And some builders don't like that. I mean, I've heard it said in South Australia that basically there's a builder's cartel almost and they'll refuse to accept any sort of meaningful liquidated damages. But why as a developer should you pay for their failure to organise themselves? And so, you know, that's a common one. Um, in terms of some of the clauses in the contracts, and, and in Victoria, we use basically standard domestic building contracts for most jobs. Um, and, you know, what people don't realise, I think, a lot of the time is those contracts are actually prepared by the Builders Union. So either the Master Builders Association or the Housing Industry Association. So as a developer, do you think they were looking after your interests or the builders? You know, it's self-evident when you put it that way that they're really looking after the builders' interests. And that then leads to some of these problems. So, for example, they put in a progress payment. The standard clause in the contract says that you're supposed to pay that within seven days. Most developers are relying on um, banks to fund. Very few banks are going to turn that around in seven days. Um, so there's a problem there. Most banks, and, and increasingly in the last sort of couple of years, that banks have become more aggressive about the information they want. What does the contract say about what the builder has to provide? Not much, really. They just have to send you a bill. But that won't give you the bank the information the bank wants. And, you know, we've I've, I've seen a couple of cases where the builders put in these crappy progress claims and the bank's screaming, well, we need more information. So we can't pay you until the builder provides us all this extra information. The builder says, well, I don't have to provide that. And what's worse, now you're late, so I'm going to suspend work, so I'm going to start charging damages and blah, blah, blah. I mean, that's just not somewhere you want to go. And a little bit of forethought and a little bit of awareness will solve that problem. Um, you know, and then there's a range of other things you can do in terms of getting the contracts right. I mean, um, if the contract's terminated, most of these contracts provide that the builder's entitled to either fair, some sort of fair remuneration for the work they've done 
or alternatively you can deduct from the contract price what it costs you to get another builder to finish the job. But then what happens to liquidated damages? What happens to the professional fees you've probably incurred and I don't know what other expenses you might incur to actually get there? But the contract doesn't say you can claim those, so you're now wearing the liquidated, liquidated damages, which seems rather unfair. And what about deposits? Because I know there's this view and sort of standard with, a, a, with smaller residential development builds that there's a 5% deposit upon signing of the contract, which I think is pretty generous. I, look, I don't mind that so much. What I do mind is the other side of it. Someone uh, once put it to me this way. And he said, you know, at the start, most builders, a lot of builders, I won't say most, but there are a lot of builders out there that don't manage their business or their finances particularly well. They're thinking about the end of the week, they need some money to pay their wages and some bills, so they look around and think, where am I going to get a large chunk of money this week to pay my bills? And the answer is rarely by finishing the job and getting the last 10% payment because the fixing stage, the frame stage, and that's more fun builder stuff, that's what they want to do. They do not want to wander around with you looking at every little bit of chipped paint and that architrave's not straight and we want this fixed and we don't like that. That's not what they enjoy doing. It's fiddly, it's time consuming, it's a pain in the backside, and at best there's you know a 10% payment for it. So yeah, I think there's a fundamental misalignment of incentives. So in my perfect world, I don't mind the 5% deposit. What I'd like to see is something like a 20% payment at the end because, frankly, for a developer, a 90% complete project is useless. The only stage from a developer's point of view that's really, truly useful to you is completion. But when you look at the schedule of payments, sometimes the builder's getting 5 maybe 10% to finish it, so there's a fundamental misalignment of incentives. Now, again... Getting a builder to agree to a 20% final payment is going to be bloody hard because they're used to getting 10%, if not less. But, you know, I think it's something to be aware of, I guess. Yeah, I just think 5% on a, you know, a multi unit, a larger multi unit development, which could be a couple of hundred grand, is a fair whack of cash that just goes off to the builder and is probably a lot more than any of the materials or insurance or starting costs that they may have. Look, I agree, um, but then these figures aren't set in stone. I mean, they're negotiable. So, you know, I know the um, in Victoria, the Domestic Building Contracts Act has a standard schedule, um, but it is possible to vary that. And so what's the advice on a building contract? Get some, get a solicitor, property solicitor to look it over before you... Yeah, well, well look, I mean, some of these... Before you enter into it. It's not hard to, uh, you know, have a contract worth more than half a million dollars. I, I think it's worth spending a little bit of money talking to a solicitor who's got some experience in the area about, you know, what can I do to make this a bit better? What might I think about? What special conditions should I insert? Those sorts of questions. And so if a client comes to you with a standard industry contract, yep. what do you kind of turn around and say don't use it or do you no, make look, some, try to look it, to make some amendments to what's in there? It is a standard contract and uh, you know, as I mentioned before I'm, I don't have a problem with standard contracts as a concept but in the case of the HIA and MBA contracts I think they're slanted a bit in favour of the builder so there probably are half a dozen special conditions that I would insert as a matter of course. You know, let, let's make sure that, you know, that, that we that if the contract's terminated, you can claim all the delay costs against the builder. Um, let's make sure that they're obliged to give um, the bank whatever information the bank reasonably wants. Let's ask them to fix defects, not in one hit at the end, but as they arise, which if you look at the standard contracts, if, if and I had a case with a client recently where some of the ceiling heights were wrong um, and the builder just refused to fix it. And contractually, there was nothing the client could really do because all the defects had to be fixed at the end. But if you think about a ceiling height being wrong, if you're leaving it to the end, you're really not serious about fixing it, eh? It's funny you should say that. On my last project, we had the wrong ceiling heights, but it was still at the framing stage. <laughs> so I pointed it out to the builder and <laughs> they tried to say, oh, well, they'll be okay. <laughs> uh, no, <laughs> build it to the right height, thanks very much. <laughs> but at least we caught it there and it did get fixed. So, um, And then what about off the plan sales contracts? 
Uh, yeah, well, that's where you start to get these sort of longer contracts. And in terms of repairing them, um, you know, I think there's a few things to be aware of. Obviously, we've got um, fairly prescriptive sort of requirements from a consumer protection point of view as to what needs to be in them, what rights you've got. Um, we've seen some changes in terms of limiting the uh, developer's right to terminate um, because the project, because the plan of subdivision is not registered, the so-called so sunset provisions. Um, but there's a number of other consumer protection provisions that need to be um, thought about. Um, I, I guess the other thing from a big picture point of view that I'm always keen to look at is this um, off the plan contract needs to sit well with your building contract. It needs to sit well with your lending contract because you know, particularly if you're relying on pre-sales to get your finance, you need to make sure all that sits together. Then maybe you've got a tripartite deed somewhere as well that needs to sit in there. So you get to a point where all these contracts need to start to work together. So you might have the best off the plan contract in the world, but if it's not consistent with your other contracts, the whole thing starts to cause problems. Yeah, you know, as I said, I mean, one of the sort of easy things that I, I encourage clients to do is to take um, use the same um, plans and specifications in both their building contract and their off the plan contract to make sure that there isn't a divergence. Um, the other thing is that, you know, from a specification point of view, more detail is always better. Um, you know, I've seen some people have sort of one page of specifications for, you know, four unit development. I mean, really? <laughs> That's just going nowhere close. And then what about the finance? contracts because normally they'll come to you from the lender mm. saying here's the contract well that's Sign when you the that's when, yeah well that's the golden rule he who has the gold makes the rules um, and so you know I mean I yeah there's very little point trying to negotiate your mortgage or your funding agreement they just are what they are maybe you've got some wriggle room in terms of some of the fees but what's important though is that um, you know particularly um, once you get beyond sort of three or four units, um, your lender may want to be relying on your pre-sales contracts. That may be a condition of your funding, which means you've got to make sure that your off-the-plan contract is unconditional and in a format that's acceptable to your lender. Now, you've got to be careful with that because sometimes you have, when you start your pre-sales campaign, you haven't selected your lender yet. So you've got to make sure you've got fairly robust off-the-plan contracts so that uh, you don't then have to run around cap in hand to your purchasers asking them to agree to amendments and variations. Yes, which I've had to do in the past, and it I can get oh, just more to sunset clauses being extended by a couple of months just to satisfy the banks that it's beyond twelve months beyond completion. So oh well, some of them. I mean, I mean, where I've, I saw uh, an off-the-plan contract with a six-year sunset clause on it. It was a large apartment building type thing, but the banks are very, um, very conservative in terms of what um, sunset provisions they require. I mean, you might think you've got a twelve-month build frame build time frame, they'll probably still want two and a half years of sunset clause minimum. So it's one of those details you need to get right and you need to be aware of. And I, and I think in terms of um, yeah, this process, a good um, finance broker is invaluable because they'll have a fairly good idea of what the market expects in terms of you know sunset clauses and a bunch of other requirements. Um, you know, and then those, you know, the lending requirements and criteria are still sort of moving at the moment. Yeah, it's been a moving feast for the last couple of years now. Well, on the upside, I mean, uh, the feedback I'm getting is that there's development sites out there that are still sort of cheaper than they have been. And um, so if you can get your finance right, you know, the opportunities are there, which, you know, perhaps a year ago, two years ago, the development sites were too expensive to make it work. Now the development sites are cheaper, but you've just got to find a way to get the money. Uh, it's always a challenge with property. There's one one part of the process is usually a bit easier than the other. If it was easy, everyone would yeah, do it. That's right. It's and a bit like a money. seesaw. <laughs> now you touched on joint ventures before, so yep. I know you've authored a a book about joint well, ventures. Or I mean, you've done some lots of articles on getting well, joint ventures right. All of all of the above. I mean, one of the things I've tried to do over the last couple of years is trying to encapsulate all this experience and knowledge and put them into sort of guides. So, um, yeah, in the case of joint ventures, let's talk you through the whole process of joint venture from start to finish. You know, when 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 might we think about a joint venture? What structure do we use? Um, yeah, heads of agreement. How do we find joint venture partners? What sort of joint venture? All that sort of stuff, and try and put it in a, in basically in a manual so people can work through it. Um, because the reality is that you know legal time is expensive 
Um, but you know, if I can put it into a sort of manual with sample documents and checklists and all that sort of fun stuff, and, and case studies as well, because um, I, I think it's important to understand where people make mistakes and where that leads to, and also what best practice looks like. Um, so we put all that together in a manual. Um, you know, people can then sit and study it and go through it at their own pace, or as it's relevant to them. You know, I mean, there's no point in me downloading a whole lot of information, two thirds of which people aren't ready for yet. But if you've got it in a manual, then you can start to sort of work your way through it when you're ready. So we've done that for joint ventures, we've done that for property development contracts generally, and we've also done that for private lending. Um, and, and whether that's borrowing money for a development project or wanting to invest in um, a, a development project or another property investment. Um, one of the things that I've seen too much of, and it's quite sad, is people who, you know, with the best of intentions, either borrow or lend reasonably large amounts of money for property projects and then something goes wrong and um, the lender finds that their uh, their security is not what it should be, that it's all gone sour. And, you know, in, in some cases I've seen people basically lose a million dollars or more basically because they didn't understand what they were doing, the documentation wasn't good enough, they didn't get the right advice. Um, and it's tremendously sad and unnecessary to see that because I'm a big fan of, you know, uh, private lending. I think there's a great role for that, particularly with um, lending being as restrictive it is, as it is right now. Yeah, well, I've read through some of the joint venture stuff that you've written and you do a really good job of posing questions that I think people don't consider when they're doing the joint ventures or thinking about what a joint venture actually is. Oh, thank you. Um, but, I mean, for me, the, the most scary thing is they, they talk about, you know, I mean, you know what you know, hopefully you know what you don't know, but the scary thing is the stuff that you don't know that you don't know. Oh, the so old, there's the inter- Donald Drums- Rumsfeld. The is known unknowns, the unknown unknowns. Exactly. So <laughs> it's the unknown unknowns that are scary. And I mean, if I can show people what best practice looks like, if I can talk people through the process so they can see where they're going three or four or five steps ahead, hopefully they can plan better. Even if all that means is a trigger to go get some advice or, or to get some input from somewhere else. I mean, that could be tremendously useful because I've hopefully saved them from walking into a black hole that they didn't know was there. Yeah, because joint venture can mean a whole range of things. It can oh, it can. Partnering with a landowner, partnering with a relative, a friend. Oh, yeah, I mean, certainly that. Ways. But I mean, from a, a legal point of view, the expression joint venture doesn't refer to a specific structure like, a, like for example, a company or a trust does. Um, so a joint venture, in very simple terms, it could be a partnership, it could be a trust, it could be a company, or it could be an unincorporated association. And there are reasons why you might look at each of those in different contexts. Um, and I guess the first step is to be aware that there are different alternatives there that you could use and then to have some awareness about when to use each. And, you know, I'm, some people are sort of inclined to think, well, there must be a one-size-fits-all best answer. Well, no, there's not. Um, it's about tailoring these structures so that we can give you the right structure or the optimum structure given the position you're in, given where you're trying to get to and what, you know, what other restrictions you might face. Because as you can imagine, there's a bunch of tax issues, there's lending requirements that float around all of this, bearing in mind the golden rule, of course, and yeah, potentially other issues um, in terms of what different investors or different um, joint venture um, parties might want or expect out of the transaction. All right, well, I think you've got a lot of these guides available on your website that people can purchase. They are on the website. Um, you know, I'm happy to give your listeners a, um, a 15% discount. Um, we'll come up with a code, which I'm sure you can post and people can plug it in and get a 15% discount if they order. Yeah, well, there's some really good content in there. As I said, the joint venture one I read through and thought it's actually great questions in here or things to think about when you're doing a joint venture in terms of what you're bringing to the table, what you're offering, what the return's going to be, all those sort of questions that maybe you don't know, as you say, you don't know to ask or know to th- or think about. Thank you. I mean, I, I, I've tried to do the same thing with property development contracts. You know, let's go through each of these contracts that, that you probably expected to sign in the course of a, a, you know, a reasonable development. And let's talk about what they are and, and let's look at the five key things you need to get right in each of these sort of um, contracts because, you know, by a dozen contracts, five key things to get right, that's like 60, 60 points. And if you can get those 60, point rights, 60 points right, I think you're on the long, uh, yeah, a long way ahead of most people. And then finally, options. 
Option Options. agreements. They seem to be a sort of uh, cure-all or a hot topic for people who think they can use options to secure land without a lot of money. What's yeah. your view on them? Can they be used uh, effectively? What's, what's the secret to them? Look, they can be used and they can be effective and I've certainly had clients um, make good money out of them. I don't think it's as easy as, as some in the press would have you believe. And there are a range of sort of complications and issues that people need to be aware of. First and foremost is always stamp duty. Um, I, I think most people underestimate how aggressively, particularly in Victoria, the State Revenue Office protect their stamp duty base. I mean, they're up to, I think, six or seven billion dollars a year in stamp duty. Um, and in the in the response, you know, and that had ramped up significantly over the last couple of years with the property market going up. Then when it corrected a little bit 12 months ago, um, the Victorian Treasury had come to rely on these huge windfall stamp duty amounts and their response was, well, it's crying poor and how do we shore up the revenue base? So um, don't ever underestimate how aggressive they are about protecting it. Um, and there have been quite a few changes in Victoria over the last 10 years in relation to options. So. Um, you know, if you assign options where there's land development, and that, would, that could be as simple as, on the face of the legislation, preparing a plan of subdivision, then the state government here is going to say, ah, two transactions, fantastic. You know, so you've taken your half million dollar site that you had an option on, you've got, so you prepared a plan of subdivision, you flipped it on for, let's say, 650000 So the State Revenue Office will say, great, there's one transaction at 500000 we'll have our you know, it's probably twenty-five thousand dollars worth of stamp duty on that. There's another one at six fifty. We'll have another thirty thousand dollars worth of stamp duty on that. Thanks for coming. Um, and you know, that's that that sort of double stamp duty problem applies not just to options, but also nominations under contracts if you're not careful. And they've it used to be that we could get out of all of this with joint ventures, but now they've changed the rules on joint ventures. Um, and I think they're particularly aiming at the sort of joint ventures between land developers and farmers where they cut up you know, huge farms into uh, residential lots. But it will have um, an impact on any property worth more than about a million dollars, depending on your um, context. So stamp duty is something you need to get right and a huge limitation in terms of what you can and can't achieve with options. Um, the next thing is, um, I, I guess, vendor or owner resistance because for most um, vendors, an option's a bit strange and unusual. It's not something they're used to, and if they run off to their lawyer, they get the fear campaign. Um, so you do get some resistance in terms of options. Um, I mean, there's a couple of ways to address that. One's by having you know, a, a, a better sort of commercial discussion with the owner to explain what's going on and why you're going to an option. Another is to um, basically convert your option into a standard contract. So we take a standard real estate contract and we put the right special conditions in it. Now everyone feels more comfortable, even if the legal sort of effect of it's much the same. But yeah, I, I, on, in an overall sense, I guess what I say in relation to options is they can work, um, but you need to be very careful. And I think it's more hard work than, than most people realize. Mm -hmm. Okay, interesting. Um, any other parting pieces of wisdom or advice? Um, I, I guess my sort of overall comment is, um, I, I don't know whether you watched the movie The Castle. One of my favourites. Dennis DeNuto talked about the vibe <laughs> of the thing. Um, look, that's a nice fantasy. Um, but the practical reality in, in, in Victoria at the moment is it is a uh, fantasy. Um, our legal system is about increasingly technical and onerous requirements. No one's interested in, I didn't mean to, or I was trying my best. That doesn't cut it, unfortunately. Unless you're a politician. Don't start me on that. <laughs> I mean, the, the, the simple answer to that is there's only one major profession I can think of that you don't need a license for. And it happens to be politician, but that's another story. Um, so yeah, un unfortunately, the rules are getting more complicated, more technical, and the um, penalties and the consequences for breaching them are becoming more onerous. Um, so I think uh, as much as instinctively I don't like it because I'm in favour of allowing people sort of the latitude to sort of do what they, you know, try and maximise their wealth any way they say, see fit, um, there is a more restrictive environment and, and it means that more, more than ever I think it's important to get the right advice up front and to avoid some of these nasty pitfalls and 
and uh, unavoidable delays and expenses, which you know I think kill to, you know, property development as a as a profit making enterprise. Got any rules of thumb in terms of cost allowance that you would put for legals? Like if you're you know, one percent or 075 percent or. I mean, look, it depends what you're trying to do. I mean. Um, it's hard to give you a sort of blanket rule like that. I suspect other people have them, um, but it depends on the context of what you're trying to do, how big a project it is. A bigger project can probably shave some some percentage points. Um, tends to be how proactive you want to be, how much advice do you want to get up front rather than later. Um, yeah, how much do you value good advice or just good enough advice? Very true. Well, Lewis, it's been great talking to you today. People are interested in finding out more about you or the firm or getting looking at the guides, where can they go? They can find me at lewisobrien.com.au, L E W I S O B R I E N.com.au. And, and again, I mean, yeah, my sort of focus has always been trying to be a little proactive in the advice, and I've always encouraged people to ask a question rather than you know, blindly go on and do something silly. Um, it might be slightly embarrassing to ask a silly question, but fixing an, avoid, an avoidable mistake is a whole lot more unpleasant. Very true. Well, Lewis, really appreciate your insight and wisdom in terms of the legal side of property development, which is perhaps not the sexy side, but definitely <laughs> very, very important. It has its moments. I mean, it's hard to compare the story of the guy who was building a, uh, a you know, with those prefab concrete walls opposite the council chambers, and one of them fell over in the weekend. Oh, really? I haven't read that. This was a, well, this was a number of years ago. But the legal side can be very fun. <laughs> well, we appreciate you taking the time today and sharing uh, your ideas and thoughts with us, and I'm very grateful to you. Thanks for having me. See you later. Bye. Okay, there you go. An interesting discussion around some of the legal issues you need to be aware of as a property developer. Now, if you're interested in any of Lewis's online guides and resources that are available on his website, you can use the code PROPDEV15, which is P-R-O-P-D-E-V and the number 15, to get 15% off the asking price. Now, I've had a look through the guides and there is some great stuff in them. Lots of questions that you need to be aware of and answer before you enter into any agreement. So head over to www.lewisobrien.com.au and O'Brien is with an E for more information. Here are three things I took out of my conversation with Lewis. One, get good advice up front before you enter into a contract. Throughout any development project, you will be entering into many contracts, and most of them are pretty important. So I think it's crucial to get good legal advice before you enter into anything that might curtail what you want to achieve. A small one-liner in a contract might be the difference between success and failure, and it might be something that reads innocuously to you and me. Like all good consultants, their advice should save you money in the long run, so make sure you have yourself a good property lawyer. Two, make sure your contract is tailored to the purpose. As Lewis mentioned, you're going to enter into a few contracts through the life of a project, and you want to make sure that each one of them is fit for purpose and protects your interests where possible. The big ones are the initial sales contract for the site, consultant contracts, finance offers, off the plan contracts, and of course, the building contract. As the leader of the project, you have the ability to shape the contracts that get used, so be sure to get your legal team to ensure the contracts you sign are not going to bite you later. 3. Allow sufficient budget to cover decent legal advice. I often hear of people trying to scrimp and save on the consultant's costs. And sure, you shouldn't just pay whatever you get presented with, but I would advise you to allow sufficient budget for your key consultants, like the lawyer as good advice up front can save lots of pain later, and it can also provide peace of mind to you that key things are covered off. I look at key consultants as project insurance and a risk mitigation measure. Now, speaking of contracts and entering deals, you might want to go back and listen to my discussion with ex-FBI hostage negotiator Chris Voss in episode 33. Chris provided some excellent tips on how you can generate amazing results including this tip on how you can fast-track your negotiation discussions. 
feed it back to them, paraphrase it, how they feel about it, till they say that's right. You then begin to move forward at light speed as soon as the other side feels hurt. So many problems are eliminated. So many barriers come down. So much cooperation ha- happens as a result of that. My chat with Chris is still one of my favorites. So go back and take a listen to episode 33. And I highly recommend his book, Never Split the Difference. Okay, remember, if you're interested in learning how to develop property, then drop me an email, justin at propertydeveloperpodcast.com for more information. Don't forget to catch me on Insta and Facebook for all my latest projects, pics and videos, industry news and other fun tidbits. You can also post a comment on iTunes if you're enjoying the show. I do read them all. And of course, all the past episodes of the show can be found at www.propertydeveloperpodcast.com. So until next time, may all your contracts be watertight and protective of your interests. You've been listening to the Property Developer Podcast. Tune in next time for more tips, ideas and inspiration to take your developing to the next level. For more developing love, make sure to visit propertydeveloperpodcast.com.